afternoon. <laughs> Today we'll be discussing the concept of a bracha, blessings. You know, the different significance and ideas relating to them. We'll start, you're not going to believe this, but we'll start with the, the idea talked about in the Gemara, brachot, a machloket, a dispute between Rav and Rabbi Yochanan. Rav says any blessing without mentioning God's name is not a blessing. This approach is self-apparent. Obviously, the blessing is directed towards God. Without mentioning God, something is missing. Rabbi Yochanan seems to argue and says that no, any blessing without mentioning the uh, malchut, the idea of the, God's kingship, is not a blessing. Uh, the commentators explain he's not arguing with, with Rav. He agrees you need to mention God's name. He's only, he only comes to add the requirement of mentioning God's kingship as well. So we paskin, the halacha l'ma'aseh brought in the Shulchan Aruch, the ruling is, in accordance with Rabbi Yochanan, that every, any blessing for it to be considered a proper blessing has to both mention God's name and God's kingship. Then it's a proper blessing. So one might want to ask, one might want to understand, what are they arguing about? Why isn't, why according to Rav is it enough to say just God's name? And why, according to Rabbi Yochanan, is that not enough? But does it further require to mention God's kingship? So this is what we want to try to appreciate and understand. In order to get in deeper into what's going on, we want to try to really put a, get a clear understanding of what is the whole concept of making this blessing. Why is it so important to make a blessing? Why did the rabbis institute in so many cases to make blessings? So for that, we have to back up a little bit. We have to back up and understand, really, the idea of the world that which God made and the manner in which he made this world. So going back to Adam, Adam Arishon, the first person, we know that God made Adam, and God established a relationship with Adam and Eve, of course. And things were great until, unfortunately, we know the first sin occurred, and at that moment, th things changed drastically. Uh, one of the greatest uh, changes, one of the most you know, unfortunate changes in the world after the first sin was that the presence of God left from this world and it, it went up to the world above, to the more the spiritual heavenly realms. And this world changed in nature. That when you look around in the world and this is the way it is today, one doesn't see the presence of Hashem. One doesn't feel the presence of Hashem. We call it in, he in Hebrew, it's called the Hester Panim, a concealment of God's presence. There is a, a, God's presence is concealed and we see what? We see nature. We see a world that works and runs, and we see people doing what they want to do. Wicked people are successful. Righteous people, unfortunately, sometimes are not successful. Almost the person can convince himself that there's chaos, and there is no real person in charge. Uh, not person. There's no more, longer a, a controlling force, a, a force in, that's in charge of the world. This story comes up a lot. The, we talked, we're taught with, with Avram Avinu, that Avram Avinu was born in a time of chaos and darkness. Uh, the, most of the world was worshipping idols, committing all kinds of, uh, you know, disgusting type of behavior, uh, murder, robbery, rape, we don't even, we don't, and, 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 and more. We're not going to get into all of the details. But Avraham, he, from the age of, of a young child, has different opinions, what age, three, you know, bar mitzvah age, but he started to study the world, and he started to ponder on how the world works and he came to realize that there must be someone in charge of the world, something that is in charge of the world. And he came to recognize the existence of God. And furthermore, he came to recognize that not only does God exist, but that God is present in the world. And furthermore, that God is running things, that God is ultimately in charge of everything and in control of everything. And it is through reaching these realizations that is why God, part of why God chose him to be the beginning of the Jewish people in order to spread this faith and knowledge of God to his children and to the world. So with this in mind, we can appreciate now, go back to the argument between Rav and Rabbi Yochanan and understand what they're really discussing. We are involved in a lot of things in the world. We eat ten times a day. Some people, you know, even more. I won't tell you how many times I eat each day, but, you know, people eat, drink, Sometimes it's healthy, sometimes it's not, which is really doesn't make any difference. We're, talk, we're not talking about health right now. But the rabbis saw an opportunity for, to institute to make blessings every time we eat. Because a person, every time he eats, he interacts with the physical world. He consumes part of the physical world and he 
is life depends on food. And so they realize that if we enact these blessings when a person eats, it's an, the best opportunity to constantly remind the person of reality. While he, you know, because he'll eat so often. What's the reality we want to remind the person of? So we mentioned with the whole story of Avraham. Rav says that we must remind ourselves constantly that God exists. And he, that is represented in his opinion that you have to have God's name in a blessing. Because if we're not aware of God's presence and God's existence, then we haven't, we don't know, not, we don't, we're living in the world blindly. So the, the idea of making a blessing has to include God's name. Because that's going to remind us that God is real, that God exists. Because again, after the original sin of man, that idea became confusing. So much so that subsequent generations, after the Adam, started to believe, first of all, they believed that God is not in control. They also began to believe that God is not present. And ultimately, they believed that God doesn't even exist. All this is a result of the, of, of the Hester Panim, God hiding himself, God, his presence from the world, and creating a world where the question of whether God exists or doesn't exist is here. So through the bracha, Rav tells us, it's to, it's to bring a person back to the original frame of mind that we're meant to have, that Adam had in the beginning, is that certainly God exists and God is here. And every time you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, you are bringing that idea out from a concealed state. You are strengthening that idea in a person's mind, in a person's heart, and affecting the world. Because the idea of a blessing is to also draw down divine revelation. And so when you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you God, you are revealing in a very real way the fact that God is real and that God exists and that He's present. Now, you might think that's, that's super. And I would agree with you. So the question is now on Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan, why aren't you so, why aren't you happy with Rav's opinion? Why isn't it enough for you what Rav said? That's great. If the whole world could realize that God exists and that God is present, we would have a much better world, wouldn't we? I think everyone could agree with that. So what's Rabbi Yochanan arguing about? Why isn't he content with that? So the answer is that it's only really half of the process that we need to go through. Recognizing God's existence is only part one. Ultimately, we have to understand that God is in control. That God, the kingship, the kingship of Hashem, God is the king, God is in charge, God is in control, and we must be obedient to God, and we must follow God's way. We don't have the opportunity to do what we want, especially if it's contrary to what Hashem said. Unfortunately, there are many people in the world that recognize that God created the world. You know, if you ask a lot of people, they'll, if you, do you believe that God exists, they'll say yes, but they'll be reluctant to accept the, God's rules. So ultimately, Rabbi Yochanan comes to tell us, so what if, if you accept God's existence? That's not enough. That's actually more insulting. To accept that God exists and then say, but anyway, I'm going to do what I want? That's more of a slap in the face, so to speak. At least someone who doesn't know that God exists, he can, I mean, it's obviously worse, but ultimately he's not going against Hashem willfully. He thinks that there is no God. He's, it's unfortunate, he's wrong, but he's not rebelling against God knowingly, actively. But someone who says, I believe that God exists and then does the opposite of what God wants, he's rebelling against Hashem. He's betraying Hashem more willfully. So Rabbi Yochanan says, just to make a blessing that says God is here is not enough. You have to also say that God is Melech HaOlam. God is the king of the world, and God, it's God is the one who creates and, and, and the rules, and it's our job to follow those rules. We do not have the op option to create our own rules. Like, unfortunately, you have in this modern world different philosophers and different philosophies that are the ultimate definition of truth is what man decides. Man is the ultimate of creation. Therefore, he is the one who decides ultimately what is true and what is moral. With leaving morality up to man to decide, that what you're really saying is we're going to play ping pong with morality. Today it's on your side, tomorrow it's on my side. Today this is allowed and this is moral, tomorrow this is not moral. Because man's decisions can often be manipulated by his emotions and by his desires. And therefore, that's not going to be a truthful result. But it's convenient, you know, because if a group of people want a certain thing and they want to live a certain way, so they can convince themselves and others that this is the correct way. Tomorrow, another group will come and say, no, you're wrong, and convince us all of a new way, to, to, a, new, a new true path. Truth is not up to man to decide. It's for Hashem already decided what's true. And our job as people in this world is to be loyal to the way of Hashem, to be loyal to Torah, 
and to be loyal to the morality that the Torah teaches us. And that is included in the idea of God's sovereignty. Every Rosh Hashanah, we accept God as our king and we proclaim that we will be obedient subjects to that king. We also mention God as a father, which is very beautiful, because there's not only a king relationship, but a father relationship as well. God loves us like, like a father loves a child. But there are rules in this world. And the world is not going to be a, com a proper world. It's not complete until we both accept the relationship that we have with God through love, like a father, and also that he's our king and we have to follow his ways. When we commit to following God's ways and we make this world a world that, that follows the, the mitzvot, that the way that God said so, that's when we ultimately and in a full way invite God back into the world. This goes back to what we said in the beginning. When man sinned, and also with the subsequent generations that, that sinned further, we pushed away God's presence. How do we bring Hashem back into this world? When we invite Hashem back into the world through accepting Him as our King and being loyal to what He says and not what we want, we bring God back into the world. We make the world Hashem's again. And that is the ultimate power and message within a bracha. When we say, blessed are you God, King of the world, what we're really saying is that we need to recognize God's presence and God's control and God's sovereignty. Then it's Hashem's world again. Then we get to partake and participate in Hashem's world. What's the opposite? When we do not recognize God's sovereignty and the fact that God's rules are absolute and incumbent upon us, and we go further and to say that God doesn't exist, that God's not present, so we take God out of this world, and this becomes a world of uh, anarchy, a world of darkness, a world of foolishness. So those, those are the different options that we have in front of us, and we see now how important it is to work on the blessings and to realize what they mean and how it teaches us how to think properly and act properly. This is one idea to appreciate you know, the depth of what it is when we say a blessing on food, on other things as well. What I'd like to discuss now is another idea. This is more based on, on, on more Kabbalah, a bit of a spiritual approach to the power of a blessing. We don't realize, the, you know, the Shlomo HaMelech says that life and death is in the hands of the mouth, the tongue. We can speak and we can create and build. We can also destroy through our speech. God said that I give the power of blessing into the hands of the Jewish people. The sages explain, you know, Yaakov and Esav were brothers. The blessing of Yaakov is the voice of Yaakov, the voice of prayer and the voice of Torah. That is the weapon of Yaakov. That is the job of Yaakov. And we, of course, are, are the descendants of Yaakov. What is Esav's breath blessing? It says that Esav will live by the sword. That's the, the, the bracha that Esav took. We have to understand where our strength is. And we have to you know, express that. And we have to actualize our possibilities and our abilities through, through, our, through using our mouth for the right things. One of the most important things that we do every day that we wake up is make the morning blessings, and, the, and the, including the blessings of Shemona Esrei. The blessings are ultimately a, the vehicle through which we channel down divine blessing. You know, that's, that's what we say when we make a blessing. The word Baruch Ata Hashem means blessed are you God. That's the simple meaning. Many explain it to be a praise. We are saying that God is the source of blessing. The same way that we say that God is compassionate, God is merciful, so God is blessed in a sense that he is, through him, blessing, we, we receive blessing as an attribute. We're saying that blessed is like an attribute. It's the same construct. Baruch is like rachum and chanun. Rachum and chanun mean merciful and compassionate. So baruch, in the same Hebrew form, means that God is baruch. He's blessed, meaning it's a characteristic of Hashem that he's blessed, meaning that from him come all blessings. That is one way that, to explain the term blessed are you God. According to the mystics, and, and many Rishonim, that's a basic understanding. But the deeper, more real meaning of what it says, Baruch Ata Hashem, is more active. The word Baruch means to channel or draw down. So when we say Baruch Ata Hashem, what we're actually doing is we're channeling. We are drawing down a divine flow from above. And that increase of divine flow into the created realms results in blessing here below. And according to this, we're actually saying, blessed are you Hashem, we're really giving a real bracha. Because what we're saying is we want to if cause more of God's divine 
light and divine flow to come into the world. And that's much more real, much more active. That is the way the mystics explain the, what it means, Baruch Atah Hashem. In any event, the result of, of these blessings are to, to create benefit for us in this world. And that's what it means, and we started, that God gave the power of blessing in the hands of the descendants of Yaakov. It's as if, to, by way of analogy, it's as if you have a bunch of keys. You have a building and many keys, many doors, and you don't know what's going on. Hashem gave us those keys to open up those doors. And spiritually speaking, when we talk about the heavens, so there are portals and channels that we have the keys to open up. Each blessing is like a different key, opening up a different channel. First, like one is for healing, one is for par- parnasa, which means livelihood, one is for redemption, one is... F- all of the different blessings that you want to answer represent different needs. And each blessing is like theoretically a key which opens up that portal in heaven, that channel in heaven, to draw down the actual physical benefit that we're asking for. So the deeper, more powerful understanding of what a bracha is, is literally drawing down blessing from above. Now, with that, we, have, we basically have a deeper, a, more, a better appreciation for what all these blessings that we say. Because, you know, everyone, a good person wakes up and says, many blessings in the morning, many blessings in Shemona Esrei. And unfortunately, people don't understand that it's uh, a real active thing that's going on, meaning that the world and we need those blessings. They're not just... It's not just lip service. It's not just a, for, a formal thing. Like when someone's acting and someone's auditioning for a play, he's saying, he's just acting. Nothing real is happening. So we, you know, in these modern times, we don't have a sense of the spiritual realms above and beyond us. And we might think that, you know, what's the benefit of praying? I don't see anything happen from my prayers. We say words that don't, I don't even know what they mean sometimes. And I don't think anything happens as a result. It's very easy to fall into that trap to think that, Really praying and making blessings is just a waste of time. Especially making them in Hebrew, if I don't understand it, it's an added waste of time. So the, the, we have to understand, in a deeper sense, the reason why those blessings were made in Hebrew is because Hebrew is the language of creation. And it's specifically through the combination of Hebrew letters and words that the rabbis, you know, they structured the prayer in a certain way that it's that specific prayer in Hebrew, that blessing in Hebrew, that has the power to ascend up to heaven and open up these channels. The Zohar, one of the major works of Kabbalah, says that the letters and words that we say when we make blessings, they themselves ascend up to heaven. Because remember, these letters and words are unique in that they are the letters and words of creation. It says that God used the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet to create the world. It says, Vayomer Hashem, God spoke and He created. The very letters and words that He spoke is were the foundation of creation. This is not the same with another language. English, French, Spanish, these are all real languages through which human beings communicate one to another. But they're not the language of creation. Generally speaking, a language is the agreement of a group of people to use sounds and symbols to represent objects or ideas. For example, in English, we call this a cup of water. Who speaks another language over here? Anybody? French. Why do you say a cup of water in French? Okay, in French, that's how you say it. I, excuse me, I won't repeat to you, I don't get it clear, but what does it mean that this means a cup of water in English? It means whoever founded the English language had to find a way to exercise and express the ideas in his head to another person. So we have to agree that we'll call this a cup. Once we all agree that this is a cup, then in English, the way to ask for this item is to say, give me a cup of water. But the word cup and water don't have an intrinsic connection to the object that I'm holding right now. It's just a sim- symbol through which I can relate and ask someone else for this. This is not the case in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word for cup is kos. The numerical value for the word kos is significant. Then each letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. And the numerical value of the word kos equals something deeper. The word for water is mayim. The word mayim is the literal word that God said when he said, let us create water, the word, the word that creates water is mayim. It's written in the Torah. So the blessings as well, Baruch, Atah, Hashem, especially God's name, yud Kei vav Kei, that is a holy name. Saying the name of Hashem has a power behind it. It's not just like speaking in another language. And with this we'll appreciate, it's a side point, but it's very important to mention, there's a very unique halacha, 
a unique law about prayer. One can pray in any language. Did you, are you all aware of that? One could pray in any language that he understands. But there's a difference between the rule of praying in, in, in a foreign language versus praying in Hebrew. And it's like this. If a person wants to pray in English, then it only works if he understands English and he's also paying attention to what he says. You cannot pray in English and think about your laundry or your, uh, you know, I don't know, your, your shopping list. You have, to be, you have to say the words and you have to understand what you're saying. Because what's an English language? English language is only a, a vehicle through which to express what I'm thinking. The word itself means nothing if it's not, if it's not conscious on, a, on water. If I say the word water, if, let's say you could teach a parrot or a monkey to say the word water. Is he speaking? No, because he doesn't understand what he's saying. He's just saying sounds. To him, it's just sounds. Let's say if randomly a parrot starts making sounds and it comes out to be a word. Is that, a real, is that speaking? No, because speaking is expressing a thought through using the, the sound, the combination of sounds and symbols. So if I don't know what I'm saying in English, it doesn't count as a prayer. You know, I can read all day long, but if I don't comprehend what I'm saying, that's not called praying. That's not called talking in English. But in Hebrew, the halacha is the opposite. A person can pray in Hebrew even if he doesn't understand Hebrew, and he fulfills his obligation of prayer. And this doesn't make any sense. How can I fulfill my obligation of praying to God if I'm not conscious of what I'm saying? The answer is that even without your comprehension, the letters and words themselves have the same real meanings, and they ascend to heaven, and they affect in the spiritual realms what they need to affect. Of course, the more you understand and the more you apply your concentration, the better it is. But at least, with, at least if someone just prays, it still counts. And that, with that, within that, we see the unique difference between Hebrew and English. And that's why it's important. The way that these blessings were established in specifically Hebrew have a tremendous power and ability to affect things uh, in the spiritual realms that English would not have. Okay. This, these are some basic ideas to help us appreciate you know, the different blessings that we have to say every day. With this in mind, hopefully we'll return to the blessings with added uh, energy and excitement and appreciation for the opportunity that we have to praise God and to accept God as King of the world and also to bring down divine blessing from above. You know, may you all be blessed with uh, success in your future prayers, God willing. Thank you. Yom Tov. Thank you.